yoga and people who practice in church. It's actually a spiritual pagan practice. How? The type of yoga people are practicing in the church is Hatha yoga, in which the goal is to prepare the mind and the body for meditation through posturing, breathing, and shifting your focus away from thought. It is said that Hatha yoga uses the body as a ground for spiritual technique to prepare the practitioner to unite with the absolute. The body is nearly a tool in this process. Although one may become more flexible and fit doing yoga, that is not the goal of yoga, which is part of a complex spiritual system. Pranayama, which is the breathing technique practiced in yoga, and the asanas, the specific positions, are designed to enhance and induce meditative states in which one can transcend mental fluctuations and bypass rational thinking. Hatha yoga teaches how to control the body and the senses so that the yogin, that is the student, can control the mind. Raja yoga. Gradually, the body and the mind are filled by the atma, that is the pure supreme universal self. And through the death of the body, it is the resurrection of the higher self accomplished. You see, what we have to understand is that yoga is not a physical practice with a spiritual component. It is a spiritual and religious practice with a physical component. To say you're doing one without the other would be like saying, oh, I'm just having juice and crackers when you come to the table of the Lord and partake of communion. Or that getting baptized is simply a matter of rinsing off. Subhas Tiwari, a professor at the Hindu University of America with a master's degree in yogic philosophy, unapologetically clarifies the theistic implications of of yoga, stating, quote, the simple immutable fact is that yoga originated from the Vedic or Hindu culture. Its techniques were not adopted by Hinduism, but originated from it. Going on to say, the effort to separate yoga from Hinduism must be challenged because it runs counter to the fundamental principles upon which yoga itself is premised. The yamas, its restraints, and the niyamas, its observances. These ethical tenets and religious practices are the first two limbs of the eight-limbed Ashtanaga yoga system, which also includes the asana, postures, pranayama, breath control, pratihara, sense withdrawal, dharana, concentration, dahayana, meditation, and samadhi contemplation or self-realization. Efforts to separate yoga from its spiritual center reveal ignorance of the goal of yoga. It was intended by the Vedic seers as instruments of which one can lead to apprehend the absolute ultimate reality called the Brahman reality or God." End quote. In its roots, the practice is one of self-transcendence and unity with Brahman. As Hindu yoga teacher Patabi Joyce says, and I quote, the essence of yoga is to reach oneness with God, but using it, that is yoga, for physical practice is no good, of no use, just a lot of sweating, pushing, heavy breathing, for nothing. The spiritual aspect, which is beyond the physical, is the purpose of yoga. When the nervous system is purified, when your mind rests in the Atman, the self, then you can experience the true greatness of yoga." End quote. Don't you know the word yoga itself means union? We are not God. We are humans made by God. And we are fallen. You are that. God himself. Meditate this within yourself, says the Vivekachu Damani. You shall be as gods, says Satan to Eve in the Bible. Yoga is Hinduism by definition, and Hinduism echoes Satan's first lie. Even more troubling, many of yoga's poses are named after and designed to invoke and invite demonic entities and their gods. So now that we've defined what yoga is, let me tell you what the Bible says about it. Acts 15, 29 says to abstain from all things sacrificed to idols, which would include postures modeled after and made in the image and to honor demons or any other god than Yahweh, and that our bodies are living sacrifice to the one true God. Romans 12, 1. Yoga actually creates an idol out of God by reducing him down to an impersonal force and then builds a practice around bringing man into unity with this force through postures directed towards other idols. It's idolatry as a means to more idolatry with the ultimate goal of helping man step into his own divinity. Okay, it's easy to at least say it's paying homage to false gods and yielding to a self-glorifying 
Hindu practice, which then by doing so, yielding yourself to it, are opening a gateway for demonic oppression. Mainstream yogic philosophies equate the practice of yoga with the acquisition of supernatural powers that the Bible in Ephesians 6 would call principalities and powers of darkness. And other of the cities are flat out impossible, such as being able to see into your past life from your future life. Hebrews 9.27 tells us we live one life, that's it. And afterwards comes judgment. The person who does ascend to seeing their past life through their future life is either hallucinating and needs to be diagnosed psychologically, or the more likely outcome is they're being influenced supernaturally to see things that are not there. Not even to mention the Kundalini syndrome. The Kundalini serpent is believed to be a coil of energy in the base of the spine that works its way up through the seven chakras or the energy system within the body, resulting in spiritual and psychological transformation. As this coiled serpentine energy fully opens all the energy systems of the body, creating a free flow of cosmic energy. People experience a kundalini awakening wherein they enter an expanded state of consciousness. Kundalini awakenings, however, come with side effects that appear to mirror psychosis, causing symptoms such as depression, insomnia, and identity confusion. And they're becoming more and more common. More of these side effects also include what sounds like to me, some kind of possession from mild pressure in their head, visions, whole body sexual stimulations, pains in their back and their neck, and involuntary jerky movements. Seems a lot more than just stretching and breathing to me. Any spiritual consequences inherent in the practice of yoga are only amplified when you consider that most yoga classes usually involve one of these following things. The burning of incense, which is originally used for other gods, chanting and prayer, sometimes the names of gods or goddesses, meditation and not on the word of God, shrines or altars, you see them as you walk in the door, and music that is intended to alter the brain waves and shift awareness. When we consider that scientific studies have proven that ordinary stretching practices are just as effective, if not more, especially when it comes to treating back pain and promoting a healthy life. We are better off to stand firm on a biblical practice and methodology and flee from the appearance of evil. If yoga is methodological Hinduism intended to bring people into a realized state of self-divinity, and if yoga is named after foreign gods and goddesses with the intention of becoming one with them and their attributes and their essence, and if the supernatural cities and the kundalini syndrome are known side effects of proper yoga practice, this seems to be the most direct parallel to the first lie in the Garden of Eden out of every other practice in history. You surely won't die if you eat of it. You will become like gods.